If you look at the key rivalries that Notre Dame has had over its meaningful football history, you have to pick out a handful of schools as being core to the success of Notre Dame because the rivalries are so strong. When you look at the great rivalries in the history of Notre Dame football, Notre Dame USC is right there at the top. But there are numerous other rivalries that have played a huge role. Michigan, Purdue and Michigan State, Midwestern rivalries that took place each and every year. Stanford, which is becoming more and more important, a rivalry to like-minded schools that now play very competitive football. Maybe the most incendiary rivalry, the one that got hottest the quickest, was the Notre Dame-Miami series, and that is burned into the minds of football fans in their 30s, 40s, and 50s. Uh, the Navy rivalry, important uh, for some great games, but mostly because of the role that Navy played in the survival of the University of Notre Dame in the 40s. But there is one other rivalry that some may have forgotten about that was probably the most important rivalry in the early days of Notre Dame football, and that's Notre Dame Army. The Army-Notre Dame rivalry, it's had such significance in our history and in creating the brand that is Notre Dame football. Here come the Irish. The uh, shape of what Notre Dame football is today is built on a blueprint that a man by the name of Jesse Harper developed in 1913, at a time when Notre Dame was trying to decide whether to continue its football program. It made a decision to give Jesse Harper one last opportunity to see if football could work at Notre Dame. And Jesse was a brilliant man. He wanted us to embrace the opportunity to use football to promote the university. And a big part of that was going around the country, not limiting yourself geographically. At the time, most of the big games for Notre Dame had to be played away because Cartier Field was a small wooden bleachers, essentially. It was not considered suitable to bring a big name uh, team in to play Notre Dame. So thus starts this coast-to-coast -coast odyssey. At that time, the powerful teams were the Eastern schools, Harvard, Yale, Army. And Army at that time was number one. Notre Dame, on the other hand, was an unknown Catholic men's school in the Midwest. Jesse Harper, before the 13th season, wrote to Army to get a game against the cadets. Quite unexpectedly, they agreed to play us. The decision from West Point to play Notre Dame on the football field gave the Catholic University an opportunity to establish their identity and make history. The legacy of Jesse Harper and the future of Notre Dame football would depend on the tone they set on the ensuing November contest. The 1913 game, if I may, was a perfect storm. Harper came to Notre Dame. Notre Dame had an outstanding team. They had a great quarterback, Gus DeRay. And they had an outstanding wide receiver named New Rackney. They had 19 players, 18 pair of shoes. The Nuns packed lunch for them, and off they went on the train. Basically, everything that has happened since then on the national stage concerning Notre Dame football started that day. It's called the game that changed football because they used the forward pass on that day as it had never been used before. Now, that's not to say that they invented the pass or anything like that, but what happened that day was Rockney and the other receivers ran specific pass routes. DeRay throwing long arcing spirals that Rockney and the others caught on the run where they caught it in stride and continue running and, and scored touchdowns and scored this epic upset. Football was played in a different way on that day and was noticed by the Eastern press especially. The game was such a landmark that on Sunday after the game, the New York Times sports page gave it three full columns. The newspaper coverage was substantial and so those accounts quickly spread and I think it created an intense interest in what is this phenomenon that just came out of the Midwest, and it just, it just explodes from there. It's absolutely the game that put Notre Dame on the map. Uh, without Army Notre Dame 1913, it's hard to see how Notre Dame would be Notre Dame today. They came, they played, 
they conquered. And now the mighty Irish are back home after bombarding the unbeaten army. Under Jesse Harper, Notre Dame and Army continued to schedule each other, and the nation took notice as the popularity of his team grew. When Harper left the university in 1918, he insisted the program be handed to Newt Rockney, a man he believed could take Notre Dame football to even greater heights. Here is Newt Rockney, who has spent four years as a Notre Dame student athlete, four years as assistant coach, finally becomes head coach in 1918, and you know, the world basically is falling apart. On April the 6th, the United States of America declared war on Germany. You, know, you got the war, you got the Spanish influenza epidemic. Students who were at Notre Dame in 1916 and 1917 dying from the flu and dying in the battlefields of Europe. Football becomes an afterthought and games are scheduled, canceled, postponed, rescheduled. Football receded as fear spread. With the armistice of November 11th, 1918, the Great War had finally come to an end. Soldiers returned home and so did a spirit of pride and patriotism for the nation. New York City at that time, and of course the game moves into the city in 1923, but the early 20s is just ex exploding with excitement and, and entertainment and possibilities. There's, you know, there's, I think, a post-war sense of relief. You know, we've survived the Great War. I think that is central to understanding what a football Saturday would be like in New York City with Notre Dame and Army coming to town. Those coveted Army Notre Dame ducats are the password today. In this day and age of sports, the biggest stars are the players. But if you go back to the 20s and 30s, you could argue that many of the biggest stars in sports were the sports writers. And the biggest of the sports writers were in New York City. So if the Army Notre Dame game was not played in New York City, some of those big writing stars that everybody immortalized would not be writing about Notre Dame. And one of the great examples of that is the 1924 game, which Notre Dame wins 13 to seven, when the legendary Grantland Rice writes about the four horsemen of Notre Dame. The real nut of the whole rivalry is the confluence of the pride and prestige of the Army with the aspirations of this burgeoning university in Indiana and its star football coach. We're going inside them. We're going outside them. Inside them, outside them. Who had the vision to say, we can go coast to coast. We can play anybody anywhere. We would call it branding today. They didn't use the term back then, but he saw the Notre Dame brand evolving. He took it national, and a, and a big part of that was the Army game. Well, you had a wonderful reception, boys, and you deserved it. Played a fine ball game out there. He couldn't have done it without publicity. And the one series that gave Notre Dame national publicity each and every year consistently was the Notre Dame Army Series, and in particular, the games that were played in New York City. Rod, you'd be welcome any place in the world, but there's no place in the world that you could be more welcome than in the city of New York. The makeup of the country had, had a very important effect on Notre Dame. At that time, there were millions and millions of new immigrants to the United States, and they were predominantly Catholic. Suddenly, this little Catholic school out of the Midwest was winning all these major football games, and so it gave them a great sense of pride, which was never lost. The games, especially during the 40s, were just huge games. There's always crowds, and there are always the guys in the service, you know, and you took a shine to them, and you rooted for one side or the other. It was fun, it really was. Notre Dame throughout the series has held the upper hand, but not during the World War years. Army was packed with all the best talent and really thumped Notre Dame a couple of times. In 1944 and 1945, those were undoubtedly the strongest Army teams of all time. They were wartime teams, and that's where the players were. And so they beat Notre Dame by a combined 107 to nothing in those two years. That gets all flipped around post-war. It's the football battle of the century, and 74,000 fans spin the turnstiles to jam every seat in Yankee Stadium. In the 1946 game at Yankee Stadium, there were four players dressed that day that won a Heisman Trophy. On the Army side, you had Doc Blanchard and Glenn Davis, and on the Notre Dame side, you had Johnny Lujak and Leon Hart. 
So imagine it's never happened in football history having four Heisman Trophy winners dressed for the same football game on the same day. The score is still Army nothing, Notre Dame nothing, and 30 minutes more to go. And all eyes are focused on the field as the second half starts. Doc Blanchard broke into the clear. Doc Blanchard carries, breaks into the open, but Lou Jack speeds in from the side with a game-saving tackle. Johnny Lou Jack saves what would have been the winning touchdown with a diving tackle. Well, I'm glad I made that tackle because I did not think that I played a very good game that day. Blanchard said to me after the tackle, he says, uh, boy, you scared the hell out of me. He said, I says, I did? He says, yeah, I thought I killed you. <laughs> See, he weighed 220, I weighed 180. Yeah, and maybe he's close to it and didn't know it, see. People will remember Johnny Lujak's tackle of, of uh, Doc Blanchard as probably the most memorable tackle in Notre Dame football history. It is the most acclaimed 0-0 tie in the history of sports. And here's the last play. The 74,000 fans saw the football battle of the century. And now it is over. It is no score. And each has won the undying admiration and respect of the other. One of the reasons why Notre Dame has always embraced the armed services and has such uh, active ROTC programs on this campus uh, is on the side of the Basilica. God, country, and Notre Dame. On Memorial Day 1924, Notre Dame dedicated the World War I Memorial on the Basilica of the Sacred Heart, a monument designed to honor those who served. The deep connection Notre Dame felt with the military fueled a respect that transformed their games into a celebration. As the Notre Dame Army series began to fade after World War II, their respect remained intact, but their bond became even stronger through the life of one football player in the Irish backfield. For Rocky Blyer, just those words are something that helped him get through his darkest times and it helped him excel not only on the football field, uh, but in life. And ready's the quarterback, there's the snap, he hands off to Blyer, he's in the end zone for a touchdown. Think about Rocky's career. As a junior, he plays on a national championship team in 1966. In 1967, he is the football captain. In 1968, after finishing his football career, miraculously, he is drafted 417th in the NFL draft by the Pittsburgh Steelers. After traveling to Pittsburgh, Rocky was drafted again, this time by the United States Army. His next stop, was Vietnam. In Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia, the war is real. My orders came down to go to Vietnam like thousands of other young men during that period of time. I got to Vietnam in May of 69, and it was August 20th, as a matter of fact, and when I was hit twice. Rocky sustained injuries on his leg and foot, which immediately cast heavy doubt if he would ever play football again. And I finally got enough courage to ask my physician at the hospital, what do you think, doc? I mean, in all honesty, can I come back and play? His response was that he chuckled and he said, well, don't worry about it. You're gonna have a normal life. You're gonna do the things that normal people do. Just, just don't expect to get back in the gridiron because you won't have the strength or the flexibility to do the things that are necessary to be a running back in the NFL. And what he kind of did at that time was he kind of just sucked any hope that you might have right out of me. And then shortly thereafter, um, a couple days actually, I got a postcard in the mail. And it had two lines on it and it said this. It said, Rock, team's not doing well. We need you, Art Rooney. You never know when somebody's gonna make an impact or a difference in your life. And so that postcard created a little sense of hope. He ends up being hospitalized back in the United States. In October, he decides to make a stop at Notre Dame. At halftime of the Notre Dame-USC game on national television, Rocky Blyer comes to the side of the field to the microphone with Father Hesburgh 
At that time, 60,000 people went silent. It even chokes me up today to think about it. If I live to be 100, the moment that I'll remember in Notre Dame Stadium is not a moment of football being played. It's going to be a Rocky Blyer on the sideline with Father Hesburgh. If you weren't paying attention on that day, on that moment of time, the Vietnam War had a name and a face. That name and that face was Rocky Blyer. Now, for those of us watching from the stands, it was a miracle that he could even walk, that he was able to drive himself and recover and become a football player at the level he was able to do. Four Super Bowl rings is in some ways a miracle. This is a guy who embodies God, country, and Notre Dame. God, country, Notre Dame. God really is a symbol of what we believe, of who we are, and what we want to model ourselves after. Country is what we represent, where we live, our communities, our families. Notre Dame is that family unit that molds you into the human being that you are. So it's really all tied into one, those three symbols of, uh, of one belief. Rocky Blyer is everything that Notre Dame stands for. But there's another institution with a powerful creed, and that's the United States Military Academy. Your guidepost stands out like a tenfold beacon in the night. Duty, honor, country. And nobody, in my mind, at Notre Dame represents both creeds better than Rocky Blyer. Notre Dame has celebrated its relationship with Army in 50 games at 10 venues. In 2016, the showcase continues in unique fashion when the teams meet again at Notre Dame's traveling home game, the Shamrock Series. We invest so much in thinking about how we will take advantage of the once a year opportunity that is the Shamrock Series game to, to outfit our team. We start with a theme. And we don't start with what's the hot trend in uniform fashion. We, we start with the concept of what do we want to convey? What do we want to say with these uniforms? And then we work with two critical partners. One is Under Armour and the other is our football team. It produces uniforms that, that carry meaning this year's game was, was very unique. Normally we just do you know, something that feels really good for Notre Dame and, and the other team isn't really a consideration, but this time it had to be because it was Army. And the importance of celebrating Notre Dame's respect of the military without overstepping boundaries was important. And, and as we looked back in, into the annals of time and compared you know, the colors that were worn in World War I and World War II, and knowing that the memorial that's on campus was a celebration of Notre Dame's own that fought in World War I, it drew us to or led us to a specific color of green. It definitely gives the, the fatigue vibe. You know, you get the, the army feeling right now when you, when you open it up and you see. Green is a very special color in Notre Dame athletic lore, but uh, this green begins with a military green on the sleeves, which really blends into and evolves into more of a traditional green that Notre Dame has worn in its competitions to show how both the military and Notre Dame really come together. The helmets this year are, are really one of a kind. Oh, dang. This is tight. Wow. We're super excited about it because the history of Notre Dame and the hand-painted helmets. So uh, our artists captured that memorial onto the side of the helmets, but each helmet is hand-painted. Having them all hand-painted and individual, to have such a deep meaning of with this crest on here, uh, it'll be really fun to wear. Oh, and you got the inscription on the right, too, in glory everlasting. Within the design of the memorial is, is the words, in glory everlasting. And the detail and the design of each letter form dictated how we designed every single number and the word mark Notre Dame for the uniform. And the number font uh, is one of a kind. I feel like a lot of people don't know what that says because it's hard to read, but 
I love it. I love it. And Glory Everlasting is one of like the, I think one of the most beautiful things that you could say underneath God Country Never Name. I hope when people watch this game and see our team dressed like this, they'll take a moment to think about the values of the university that it reflects. This is, is all about this university's understanding that while it's, it is independent and draws its strength from its faith and the remarkable achievements of its students uh, and professors, it is also does that through the freedom and benefits that this country produces and that are protected every day by men and women like the men and women that we will be with in San Antonio for this game. As the modern era of football has unfolded, Notre Dame has taken control of the Army series with 14 straight wins. But these games, this series, has always been about more than the final score. I mean, obviously, when we get a chance to play opponents, we always have respect for the other team, but you know, having these people uh, that are gonna be fighting for this country and have dedicated their lives to do so, the respect is that much more, and it really, uh, it's really special to be able to compete with those who are gonna eventually be fighting for you and your freedoms. We want our players to play against these academies because we want them to see how those, how those young men compete. They'll be competitive games because they will play so hard and with such discipline because that's what they will have to do in their service to the country. What began with a vision and a telegraph created a destiny for a small Catholic university, a community for a growing America, and a rivalry that honors the spirit of our nation. Everything that Jesse Harper might have hoped to achieve through his complete reinvention of our program was made possible by that remarkable November afternoon but also his directive to his split end captain and successor as coach, Newt Rockney. Make sure you get the team to the iconic venues. Back then, Harper and Rockney took the football team to those cities. Now we take the university to those cities. You not only celebrate the past, but celebrate our current commitment. And when you have that much substance to a contest, it, it contributes to the sense of rivalry and the importance of the game.